The setting of the assassination of King Joash of Judah. Biblical and archaeological evidence for identifying the house of Milo. By Chris McKinney, Aharon Tavgar, Nakshon Zantone, and Joe Uziel. Excavations in the city of David with accompanying radiocarbon analyses have revealed a complex sequence for the construction of the spring tower, which is situated above and around the Gihon Spring. The radiocarbon dates indicate that the spring tower was either constructed in the late 9th century BCE or was substantially retrofitted during the late 9th century BCE. In light of this new archaeological data, this paper will re-examine the biblical data associated with the eastern slopes of the city of David and suggest that the spring tower should be identified with the house of Milo of 2 Kings 12.20, where according to this passage, King Joash of Judah was assassinated presumably in the very early 8th century BCE. The assassination of Joash occurs at the end of his royal biography in the Book of Kings, and it is comprised of the typical Deuteronomistic elements of, for Judahite kings. The bulk of the biblical account related to King Joash focuses on two main events, the coup and assassination of Athaliah, in 2 Kings 11, and the repairs of the house of Yahweh directed by Jehoiada the priest in 2 Kings 12, 4 through 16. Clearly, these events are in keeping with the larger theological themes of the Deuteronomistic history regarding Yahweh's protection of the Davidic dynasty, as seen most clearly in 2 Samuel 7, sometimes called the Davidic covenant. But it also relates to the attempts of Davidic kings to restore and further enrich Yahweh's house through the accumulation of wealth. This is due in large part to the unmatched wealth accumulation of Solomon in 1 Kings 9-10 through connected with its loss uh, by the attack of Shishak. With regards to the latter theme, Joash's refurbishing of Yahweh's temple was used as a transition to focus on the assault of Jerusalem by Hazael of Aram Damascus in 2 Kings 12.18. Hazael's assault, then, is also related to this literary cycle of wealth accumulation only to be followed by the plundering of Jerusalem by the wealth of a foreign enemy. Joash's reign occurred in an era marked by a significant number of extra-biblical texts that mention biblical kings and events. Besides the connection with Gath, the beginning of Joash's reign can be related to Jehu's coup of the Omri dynasty. This event can be connected with the contemporaneous details from the Tel Dan Stella that likely indicate that Hazael killed Jehoram, king of Israel, and Ahaziah, king of Judah, or of Beit David, as the Stella indicates. This event, which apparently led to Athaliah's coup in Jerusalem as well, is well dated to the year 841 BCE on the basis of campaigns led by the Neo-Assyrian king Shalmaneser III against Hazael of Aram Damascus, one campaign dated to his 18th regnal year, which would be 841 BC, and in that same year, Jehu offered him tribute, but also in his 21st regnal year, which would relate to the year 838 BCE. Since Jehu and Hazael's reign are well attested to in the text of Shalmaneser III, and Joash's reign is synchronized to Jehu's seventh year, which would be 836 BCE, and also Hazael's invasion of Gath, which has been well demonstrated in the excavations of Telesafi in the last 20 years or so, it seems therefore prudent to accept the regnal details connected with Joash's reign, which gives him a 40-year reign in the Book of Kings, and date the conclusion of Joash's reign to the very early 8th century BCE. It is also noteworthy that both Joash and Amaziah's assassinations occurred following the citation of the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah formula. Even if it is not certain that the Chronicles of Judah or Israel were of a similar genre or composition as the Mesopotamian analytic texts, such as the Babylonian Chronicles, 
It is worth noting that the chronistic details, short notes, following the citations in Kings often include conspiracies, building projects, and war, elements that are very consistent with the Assyrian and Babylonian court annals. Therefore, the references to the assassination of Joash and Amaziah, his son, in a textual position immediately following the annals citation might add an additional layer of historical reliability to the manner and dating of their deaths. Let us now turn our attention to the Milo in Jerusalem. The Milo was one of the main building projects connected with the narratives of the Davidic kings in Jerusalem, being attributed to David, to Solomon a total of three times in 1 Kings, and to Hezekiah in 2 Chronicles. The occurrences with David localized the Milo with the city of David and seemed to connect it with its outer periphery, as 2 Samuel 5, 9 reads, And David lived in the stronghold and called it the city of David. And David built the city all around from the Milo inward. With regards to Solomon, the three references occur in two distinct contexts. In Solomon's building achievements, where the first two occur in 1 Kings 9.14 and verse 24, and in Jeroboam's uprising in 1 Kings 11.27. The first context indicates that the construction of the Milo was noteworthy to the writer of Kings, as he uses it to symbolize the prestige of King's most powerful king and builder. They read as follows. The forced labor that King Solomon drafted to build the house of Yahweh and his own house and the Milo and the wall of Jerusalem and Hatzor and Megiddo and Gezer. And later in that same chapter, but Pharaoh's daughter went up from the city of David to her own house that Solomon had built for her. Then he built the Milo. The second context is even more interesting. The building of the Milo in this passage is mentioned as the setting of Jeroboam's initial rebellion against Solomon. This was the manner of how he, Jeroboam, lifted up his hand against the king. Solomon built the Milo and closed up the breach of the city of his of city of David his father. Regarding 1 Kings 11:27, it is established that Solomon placed Jeroboam in charge of the forced labor from the house of Joseph, who were apparently working on the Milo when Jeroboam's fateful encounter with the high of the Shilonite took place a few verses later. As we will see, the location of Jeroboam's uprising may be intertextually related to the location of Solomon's coronation at the Gihon Spring which is mentioned at the beginning of the Book of Kings in 1 Kings 1, but also Joas's assassination at the house of Milo in 2 Kings 12.20. The reference to the house of Milo in connection with Joas's assassination is the last occurrence of the Milo in the Deuteronomistic history. Given the prominence of its occurrence in the early monarchy, it is striking that the term does not appear in Kings subsequent to the death of Joash. The reference to Hezekiah's rebuilding of the Milo is outside of the Deuteronomistic history. It reads as follows. He, Hezekiah, set to work resolutely and built up all the wall that was broken down and raised towers upon it, and outside it he built another wall, and he strengthened the Milo in the city of David. While this occurs outside of the Deuteronomistic history, Abundant late 8th century BC evidence throughout the city of David would seem to support the basic historicity of this verse. This reference occurs following the famous passage associated with Sennacherib's invasion and Hezekiah's response, the stopping of the spring and the brook that flowed outside of the city and presumably the construction of Hezekiah's tunnel. In our view, it is possible that the reference to Hezekiah building the Milo was a post-exilic historical remembrance of the area around the Gihon Spring being known as the Milo. Most scholars connect Milo with the verb male, meaning to fill or be full, 
and interpret the Milo as having to do with the filling of a breach or the rebuilding of Jerusalem's fortified slopes. Yet for such an interpretation to be correct, it would have to go against the general usage of proper names for specific structures in the Book of Kings. There are numerous examples of specific buildings, gates, and zones of Jerusalem that had proper names. However, there are no examples in the Deuteronomistic history, unless, unless the Milo represents the lone example, of large building projects that have proper names. This, in fact, is true for not only the Deuteronomistic history, but the entire Hebrew Bible. In our view, particularly in light of the references which designate the Milo as a specific location, in particular 2 Samuel 5.9, but also our present text from 2 Kings 12.20, which reads, his, Joash's servants, arose and made a conspiracy and struck down Joash in the house of Milo, or in Beit Milo, on the way that goes down to Silla. These localizations to a specific location uh, go against the traditional interpretation of the Milo as a general building project connected with fortifying Jerusalem's steep slopes, and therefore this traditional interpretation cannot be sustained. Kathleen Kenyon was the first to provide supposed archaeological support for the traditional interpretation, connecting the Milo with the terrace slopes that she excavated along the slopes of the Kidron Valley. Later, Steger was critical of the traditional viewpoint and Kenyon's identification, viewing the terracing along the eastern slopes of the city of David, including the stepstone structure, as the terraces of Kidron which are mentioned in the narrative associated with King Josiah in 2 Kings 23, verse 4. In Steger's view, the textual evidence warranted identifying the Milo not with a general area, but with a specific location along the edge of the city of David's fortifications. Steger then thus concluded that the Milo should be connected with the specific area of the step stone's structure. We also disagree with the premise that the Milo must be associated with earthen or stone fill. We agree that the Milo is related to Malay and means filling. However, instead of the filling of soil, perhaps it relates to the filling of water at a notable location within the city of David. From a linguistic perspective, there is only one example in the entire Hebrew Bible in which soil or earthen fill, Hebrew afar, is used with the verb malay. This occurs in Genesis 26, 15 with regards to the dispute between Isaac and the men of Gerar about a well. But there are numerous examples in which water, water skins, or other liquid-related items are the subject or object of malay. Malay is used as a verb 250 times in the Hebrew Bible. Of these occurrences, it is used 34 times, or 13.6%, in relation to liquid with only the single occurrence, or 0.004%, connected with earthen fill. Thus, a connection between Malay and water would seem to be a much more viable textual and linguistic alternative. In a recent study, we pointed to a similar rationale for identifying the Beit Milo of Judges 9 verses, 20, verses 6 and 20, that would be the Avimelech narrative, with the site of Tel Esufan in Nablus. Tel Esufan is a bronze and Iron Age tell located just a few kilometers west of Shechem. In our view, biblical Beit Milo is preserved in Ein Beit Ilma, a large spring with a pool at the base of Tel Esufan. In the case of the Beit Milo of Judges, it seems possible that the name was derived from the proximity of the spring filling up and forming a pool at the base of the ancient city, which obviously would have been used by the inhabitants of the site to fill containers with water. Similarly, we will connect this etymological suggestion for the Milo of Jerusalem to the spring tower. But first, let us briefly examine the archaeological background of this area of the city of David. The area surrounding the Gihon Spring was previously investigated by the tunneling of Warren and Father Vincent, as well as Montague Parker. It was also excavated by Kathleen Kenyon. In more recent years, though, 
The area was excavated by Roni Reich and Elie Schukroon, and also, even more recently, by Joe Uziel and Nakshon Zantone. Initially, Reich and Schukroon discovered a very large tower with a fortified passageway and various subterranean tunnels, including the so-called rock-cut pool, all of which were dated by them to the Middle Bronze Age. However, since the pool is several meters higher than the Gihon Spring, it would seem more likely that the rock-cut feature never had a water function related directly to the Gihon Spring. Whatever the purpose of the pool or feature, it went out of use during the 8th century BCE as a small house was constructed on an enormous amount of fill within the pool itself that can be primarily dated to the late 9th century BCE and or perhaps as late as the early 8th century BCE. This fill, along with several elements in the vicinity of the Gihon Spring, indicate that the late 9th and perhaps early 8th centuries BCE was a major period of building activity in this zone of Jerusalem. Notably, Uziel and Zantone excavated building 2482 along the accompanying fortifications of the massive fortified passage that revealed activity during the late, to, uh, late Iron 2A and Iron 2B, but particularly in the late Iron 2A. In 2015, Regev et al. took several radiometric samples from a section beneath the northeastern segment of the Spring Tower that was not founded on bedrock. These samples dated from the Middle Bronze II and late Iron 2A or late 9th century BCE respectively, with the authors su suggesting two options for its construction. Option one, the Spring Tower was originally built during the Middle Bronze and then underwent major renovations in the late Iron 2A. Option two, the tower was originally built only in the late 9th century BCE. In our view, which follows the recommendation of the excavators, option one is the most likely scenario. The abundant evidence for Middle Bronze construction in the vicinity, as well as the similarity of the monumental character of the building remains in Jerusalem to other Middle Bronze fortifications, particularly at Shechem and, and Hebron, should not be ignored. On the other hand, it does seem that the late 9th century BCE was a very active period in the city of David particularly in connection with the monumental structures around the Gihon Spring, but also within Jerusalem in general. We have argued that the Milo should be connected with a large building project along the periphery of the city of David, and that it likely should also be connected with the filling of water instead of soil debris. If so, then the fortified passage, the spring tower, and the other pre-late 8th century BCE elements around the Gihon Spring would seem to fit well with the House of Milo of 2 Kings 12.20. We offer two suggestions connecting the Milo to the Gihon Spring. First, it is possible that the name is derived from the Gihon Spring filling up into the Spring Tower which surrounded it. Second, and probably more likely, perhaps the name originates from the location that was used for the filling of water containers by the inhabitants of the city. The massive spring tower was obviously meant to protect the Gihon Spring and the accompanying system of Warren Shaft and the fortified passage were clearly meant to provide access to the spring. While the dating of Jerusalem's water systems is inherently difficult, it would seem clear that there was a system characterized by monumental structures that was repaired or retrofitted in the late 9th century BCE and was likely initially built in the Middle Bronze, all of which preceded the late 8th century BCE reworking of the system by Hezekiah. The massive spring tower over the Gihon Spring would thus seem to be a good match for the House of Milo, the public structure where according to 2 Kings 12.20, King Joash of Judah was assassinated. Given the evidence of widespread Aramean military activity during this period, as seen at such sites as Tel Asafi Gath, Gezer, Aphek, and other places, perhaps the retrofitting of Jerusalem's pre-existing fortifications was due in part to withstand a possible Aramean invasion. 
This may perhaps form the historical background to the fortification retrofits seen in the Spring Tower and its environs. In addition, if the Spring Tower was in fact used as a pool for the Gihon Spring, it may also refer to the old pool that is mentioned in the famous passage of Isaiah 29 through 11 related to the construction of Hezekiah's tunnel, although on this point uh, it is far from secure. In the Deuteronomistic history, the Milo is only mentioned in connection with texts purportedly describing the 10th century to the very early 8th century BCE. It is particularly striking that the area surrounding the Gihon Spring was quite active in the late 9th and early 8th centuries BCE, with also some evidence, uh, fragmentary in fact, of earlier Iron Age remains. Therefore, we propose that the Milo should be understood as the entire and quite irregular fortification system surrounding the Gihon Spring and its waterworks that was in use in its primary form from the Middle Bronze through the Iron 2B. The name was apparently lost after the reshaping of Jerusalem's water system during the late 8th century BCE, again, probably by Hezekiah. From a textual perspective, and regardless of one's view of the historicity of the narratives involved, this identification would create a geographical intertextual interplay between Joas's assassination at Beit Milo or the House of Milo in 2 Kings 1220, the inauguration of Solomon's reign at the Gihon Spring in 1 Kings 1, 33-36, as well as Jeroboam's uprising while overseeing the building of the very same place at the Milo in 1 Kings 11, 27 and following. If the Gihon Spring and the Milo were in fact the same location, then the narrative impact of Joas's assassination with its royal harbingers would have been heightened to the Deuteronomist's audience.